This morning, if you would, take your Bibles and turn with me to 1 Corinthians chapter number 2. 1 Corinthians chapter 2. I want to speak this morning on the subject of gospel-driven missions. Here is Paul, and we see in the passage of Scripture that we're about to reflect upon where he is a man that is passionate for the gospel and obviously very intimately acquainted with the gospel as This revelation came not from man, but the Spirit of God. And he says in our text in verse 1, And I, brethren, when I came to you, came not with excellency of speech or of wisdom, declaring unto you the testimony of God. For I determined not to know anything among you, save Jesus Christ and Him crucified. And I was with you in weakness and in fear and in much trembling, And my speech and my preaching was not with enticing words of man's wisdom, but in demonstration of the Spirit and of power, that your faith should not stand in the wisdom of men, but in the power of God. It should be the desire of every believer in Christ to live life passionately for the glory of God in the light of God's suffering servant, the Lord Jesus Christ. I don't know if you've really contemplated what it means to be a man or a woman after God's own heart, but when you're a man or a woman after God's own heart, you delight in what God delights in. You love what God loves. You have an aversion and contempt for what God has a contempt for. Now we're not talking about a perfect Christian life, but we're talking about a God-besought and a gospel-driven life. Sadly, most Christians, though, miss the mark. Why? Because either they are indifferent toward the things of Christ and the gospel, or other things have been substituted for the gospel of grace. Sadly, the pleasures of this world and the toys of contemporary society have replaced our interest in the gospel. Now, one major problem, brethren, in our day, and this is so important to the message this morning, is that many ministers have preached the gospel as good news to the lost, but not as good news to the saved. The same gospel that saves us is the gospel that sanctifies and sustains us as we have heard in the previous hour. Every woe of man, whether it's personal, domestic, or ecclesiastical, you find Paul dealing with through the gospel. So, you may say, well, I believe the gospel. I believe that I have experienced the dynamic implications of the gospel, but why is it that I'm not more passionate for sharing the gospel with others, or bearing that message to the ends of the earth. Well, there are perhaps a number of different reasons for this as they apply to specific individuals. But first of all, in many people, and sadly in Reformed Sovereign Grace circles, the gospel has only come cerebrally. It has only come in word only, but not in power and in the Holy Ghost and in much assurance. And it bothers me these days of how people can articulate so gloriously the details of the gospel, and yet they know so very little of this dynamic power in their everyday life. 
It is possible to wrap your mind around the gospel intellectually and be convinced of its truth and say a resounding amen and amen from your spirit when it's preached to bone and yet not know anything of the dynamic alteration of the Holy Spirit in your life. Paul said that one of the implications of the gospel in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 15 is that it has a saving effect upon us to deliver us from ourselves. Spurgeon said, if the gospel has never changed your behavior, it will never change your destiny. The question to ask ourselves before we proceed though, friend, is has God ever done anything for you? They asked Kermit Zarley in his day when he just made enough money to maintain his tour cart on the Professional Golfers Association tour. They asked him because he was a Christian and a very passionate soul winner, wouldn't it be great if Jack Nicklaus got saved? And he looked at the man and said, yes, it would. And the fellow said, can you imagine what Jack Nicklaus could do for God? And Kermit Zarley says, Mr., can you imagine what my God could do for Jack Nicholas? And that's the issue this morning. Has God done anything for you? So we must ask ourselves this question. Has the gospel come in power? Do I have the power to overcome sin? selfishness in my life and a detachment from the world or do I continue to promote my own kingdom, demand my own way and manipulate those in my own family to advance my own self-will? Another reason may be a wrong understanding of the gospel. Many have replaced, sadly even in these circles, replaced the gospel of grace with a self-atoning gospel such as decisionism. In their mind, they still believe that it was the sincerity of their prayer that saved them, and that's why they have no power to overcome sin. It may be moralism, or even sadly, in some cases, baptismal regeneration. But these things have become subtle substitutes that deceive and damn the soul in many people. But a final reason may be a shallow understanding or an inadequate understanding of the gospel. There are not a few who believe the gospel is all about God's love for the world or the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so they therefore have said, I've got that. I'm going to move on to greater and more more profound things in my life as a Christian. So what they do is because they think they understand the gospel, they shelve that and they move on to these other things. And yet, friend, everything is the gospel. So this morning... The gospel must be at the heart of the servant that seeks the glory of God. And this should be the driving force in our lives when it comes to soul winning, evangelism, church planning, and missions. And I remind you this morning, are you going down into the well or are you holding the rope for those who do? If God were to call you into missions at this hour based on the way you pray for and believe for and support financially others that go before with the gospel, how well would you fare if God were to call you? On the basis of your activity, your obedience on the behalf of others, if you were to go by that, just how well would you be prayed for and believed for in your quest to pre- spread the gospel? Now, just some thoughts this morning on this matter of gospel-driven missions. The first thing I want to underscore, brethren, is the importance of becoming intimately acquainted with the gospel intimately acquainted with the gospel. When Paul says here in 1 Corinthians chapter 2, for I determined not to know, it denotes an intimate acquaintance with. 
This was not something that simply was an intellectual agent in his life, but something that had produced such a dynamic consequence in his life. This was the driving force in everything that he did. An intimate acquaintance. There is a book that I have noticed that are in some of the conferences that I've had the privilege of going to. I, I'm not a real conference person as far as going and sitting, you know, for a week. But it seemed like at this season of my life, my wife and I have had the privilege of going to some conferences in recent days. One was the Nuthetic Counseling there in Indiana back a couple of months ago. And then just recently to the Shepherds Conference. I've never been to either one before. But I noticed there on the book tables, there is a book that a pastor just off the campus of West Point Military Academy there in New York gave me a couple of years ago. And recently I began to read and meditate upon the content of that book, which is heavily saturated with the gospel. The book is A Gospel Primer by Milton Vincent. And so this book has been positioned in these conferences because apparently there are other people as well that are appreciating just how much the gospel constrains us to do the work of the ministry. And so Milton Vincent in his book made this statement. He says in the early part of the book, rehearsing gospel truths each day has become a pleasurable discipline by which I enjoy God's love and maintain fresh contact with His provision and power for daily living. Now, as I said a moment ago, some of us, we have a basic understanding of the gospel. And there is so much to explore. And the more you explore it, while you're not taking that and pulling yourself up by your own bootstraps to make it work in your life, there is a spiritual phenomenon that is occurring. The Holy Spirit suddenly enlivens those truths, and that becomes the very catalyst for your evangelization. It's amazing, friend, how it begins to grip your heart and be the chief motivation in your life. The gospel of Christ. And so this morning, let's look in the book of Romans at what one man has called the heart of the gospel. Romans chapter number 3. To stir up once again our minds by way of remembrance concerning this awesome and magnificent and beautiful work of atoning love. In verses 19 and 20 of Romans chapter number 3. First of all, Paul says, Now we know that what things soever the law saith, it saith to them who are under the law, that every mouth may be stopped and all the world may become guilty before God. The first thing, and let me just highlight these for you very quickly, is no one is declared righteous before God by the law. No one is declared righteous by the deeds of the law. By the deeds of the law, he says, there shall no flesh be justified. Furthermore, verse 21, there is a righteousness from God that is apart from law. This is the gospel. It is divinely provided. Verse 21, the righteousness of God without the law is manifested. Paul goes on to say in verse 22, this righteousness from God is revealed through faith in Jesus Christ. Why does God make the gospel's power contingent upon what seemingly is a very small and insignificant exercise on mine and your part. I'll tell you why, friend. To annihilate the pride of man. Because a little child can receive it. B.B. Bartley being an example there under the ministry of Jonathan Edwards, four years of age, and the power of sovereign grace took root in her heart. Yes. 
Never underestimate the power of the gospel, how far reaching it is. It can reach the youngest as well as the oldest. Furthermore, you find another part of the gospel here in verses 22 and 23. This righteousness is available to everyone on the same basis. Because all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. That's what he says there. All have sinned and come short of God's glory. And then verse 24 also, as you move along. All who put their faith in Jesus Christ are justified freely by God's grace. Being justified freely by grace. Number six, another tenet of this gospel in the context is verse 24. This justification is through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. As he says in that little phrase, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Not our own merit or our own performance, but through his work. And then finally, number seven, the heart of the gospel here is in verse 25. God presented Jesus as a sacrifice of atonement through faith in his blood. Now, I don't know if you heard what happened a few years ago at the world-renowned Mumbai Hotel there in India. But there was a terrorist attack. They went through and better than 170 people were killed and over 350 people were taken to the hospital as terrorists made their way through the lobby into the restaurant and from floor to floor killing anyone that they came in contact with with machine guns and grenades. They asked one of the survivors who was an Indian-born British actor, how did you survive this attack. And he says, well, I remember I was sitting there at the table in the hotel restaurant and having a time just of talking to my friends. And suddenly he said, I could hear pow, pow, pow. It sounded like children shooting off fireworks outside the hotel. And then it got louder. And suddenly I heard screams. And before I realized it, someone had come behind me and shoved me under the table, taken me by my shoulders and shoved me under the table. And then he said, I could see out of the corner of my eye, glass was being sprayed and, and there was machine gun fire and, and then blood was being splattered on the walls. And he said, I could see at a distance people were literally being dismembered by the machine gun fire. And he said, they moved through. And he said, I, I laid there in a death-like silence as they moved through to kill others. And then they moved up to the other level, levels. And this female reporter said, but, but how did you survive this holocaust? And he said, well, I, I laid there. And he said, I could hear a few moans around me. And suddenly one of the gunmen came back into the room. And anyone that moaned or moved, he would pump with gunfire to ensure that they were dead. And he said, when I think about it, the reason I believe I survived that attack was because apparently the gunman who came and stood directly over me, he mistook me as dead because I was covered with the blood of another. My friend, that's the gospel. Are you covered with the blood of another? While these seven statements provide a much more in-depth knowledge of the gospel, there is infinitely more that could be said about Christ's atoning work. So we need to become more intimately acquainted with the gospel. I, I, I was amazed, and I, I'm very cautious about deifying men. If I deify men, it's normally a Puritan or a reformer. You know, I have a tendency to do that, and I have to repent quickly. They're, they're men at best. But I've worked with Brother Paul Washer for the last four years, and we had the opportunity for a few years to 
mentor about 60 young men who moved to Muscle Shoals, and we would teach every Tuesday morning for two hours. And when Paul was always in town, he did the teaching. And it was amazing to me that my brother never used a note, and he would sit there in front of those men with an open Bible and lecture for two hours on things pertaining to the gospel that I have never heard before. And you could tell it just burned in his spirit. It had a contagion to it. So why do I tell you that? There is so much more concerning the gospel than what we will ever tap. Let that be your motivation for missions. Let that be your motivation for overcoming sin. Let that be your motivation for driving you into the depths of gratitude for what Christ has done for you. The Apostle Paul was a man possessed by the gospel. Everything he did, preached, and lived for was gospel-driven. His whole world was colored by the atonement of Christ. So important was the gospel to him, he said that he had determined to only know Christ and Him crucified. The finished work of Christ was at the heart of everything he did. His meditation, his counsel, his preaching, it all entertained him. This was the source of his entertainment. In Acts chapter 20, when he spoke of the persecution that would await him in every city, he declared with confidence that nothing moved him because of the gospel. When he was taken to Rome and placed in a hired house awaiting trial in Acts chapter 28, he preached the kingdom of God and taught those things concerning Christ to those who visited him. He testified in Romans chapter 1 and verse 16 that he was unashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. Whether it was the depravity of man's sinfulness before God or whether it was the very predestined and election of God, none of that moved the Apostle Paul into a shameful mode. He was unashamed of the gospel of Christ. He acknowledged that he lived by the gospel in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 and verse 14. He was supported monetarily by the gospel, but not extravagantly. He would live on just enough to live with dignity so that no one could accuse him of padding his pocketbook, lest he abuse the power of the gospel. He recognized every painful providence as a light affliction to open another door for the gospel, Philippians chapter 1 and verse number 12. These things have happened. They have fallen out to the furtherance of the gospel. When dealing with moral impurity in the church at Corinth, 1 Corinthians chapter 6 and verse number 12, what does he point you to? For we are bought with a price. Therefore glorify God in your body and in your spirit, which are not yours. When admonishing the saints at Ephesus to forgive one another, he told them how God in Christ had forgiven them, Ephesians chapter 4 and verse 32. When instructing the Corinthians to follow the example of the Macedonians in giving, he drew their attention to the gospel. He said that Christ was willing to be poor, that we might be made rich through his poverty, 2 Corinthians chapter 8 and verse 9. When instructing the Philippians on how to teach one another, he reminded them of the incarnation in Philippians chapter 2, and that once again, the death of Christ was the very lubricant and driving force to restore and to minister health to relationships. Whether he dealt with personal, family, or ecclesiastical woes, friend, he's always pointing us back to the gospel. Now, once again, Milton Vincent, listen to what he says. And and, and I tell you, friend, I can say an amen and amen. It is true, brethren, it is true. I'm just tasting it, but it is true. Listen to these words. He says, over the course of time, preaching the gospel to myself every day has made more of a difference in my life than any other discipline that I have ever practiced. He said, I find myself, now this is what's so true, I find myself sinning less. Less. 
But just as importantly, I find myself recovering my footing more quickly after I've sinned. Due to the immediate comfort found in the gospel. I have also found that when I am absorbed in the gospel, everything else I'm supposed to be toward God and others seems to flow out of me more naturally and passionately. That is true. And that's for you. And that's for me. So with what we've looked at, let's make application for a moment. Gospel-driven missions. From the life and writings of the Apostle Paul, there is much to gain and benefit from the gospel that he lived and preached. So therefore, a proper understanding and appropriation of the truths, the redemptive themes of the gospel, serves to be our supreme motivation in missions. I don't know about you, friend, but it's appalling to think that the average Christian in North America spends more money on cat and dog food than they do on missions. Why is that? They don't understand the gospel. Consider some of the gospel themes that would motivate us in missions. First of all is redeeming love 2 Corinthians chapter 5 verse 14 for the love of Christ constraineth us I, I love old books and I hunt old books especially up in New England is where basically you find them in the United States and my wife and I were up in uh, outside of Bangor Maine a few years ago down near uh, Bar Harbor and we went to this old book barn there. It's about three stories. And, uh, and upstairs, there were about 10,000 books there. And most of it was just a bunch of chaff, you know, and all kind of books. But in going through all those books for the couple of hours there, I found one book, and that was the complete works and biography of William Cooper or Cowper. And I almost didn't get it. It was 10 bucks, and normally I don't pay that much for a used book, but... My wife said, Don, you need to get it. And I'm so glad I did. Because what the author had done is he had given this rich biographical sketch of Cooper's life. And then he had included the works, the poems, and the hymns of William Cooper. Now here was the value of the book. He had taken all those poems and hymns and correlated them with the events in Cooper's life. Do you realize that on the eve of Cooper's second great insanity, which they called severe depression insanity back in those days, but when they committed him to an insane asylum, the eve before they committed him, he wrote the beloved hymn, God Moves in Mysterious Ways His Wonders to Perform. On the eve of being admitted to an insane asylum. I read that and I got great hope. <laughs> I used to justify my extreme melancholy at times, tremendous depression by saying, well, after all, Martin Luther and Charles Spurgeon got depressed. Until one day I realized that's all we had in common. <laughs> but I was blessed. But it's interesting, he writes, there is a fountain filled with blood drawn from Emmanuel's veins after he has his first severe bout with depression, debilitating suicidal depression. He goes to the apothecary, the drugstore, and he obtains some poison. You see, what has happened is he has been called to the post as the clerk of the journal to the House of Lords. But the thing he underestimated was they're going to call him forth for a public examination. And he's just devastated. He don't want to stand in front of people. 
and answer questions. So his way out is suicide. And so he goes by the drugstore, picks up poison with the intent of drinking it to kill himself, and then he can't get it to his mouth because he shakes so much. So he calls someone to come and pick him up in a carriage to take him to the river so he can throw himself off the bridge. The guy picks him up, and when he gets to the river, it's a public place. There's a lot of commerce and traffic that's happening, not to mention there is a porter sitting right there where he intends to take his life. So he said, not going to look very good for me to try to commit suicide in front of all these people. So he gets back in the carriage, and once again he tries to put that poison to his lips, and he's just so staggered, he's just shaking all over, he can't get it to his mouth. So he goes back home, and then he takes a rope and puts it around his neck and ties it to the top of the bed there and tries to hang himself, and it snaps. Well, this is providence of God, friend. And then he takes this rope, and he goes over and and puts it on the door, ties it to the top of the door, and that works for a few minutes, and he loses consciousness, and then it snaps, and he falls to the floor, and he's awakened out of this, this, this unconscious state. He's still so frustrated. He's still got a little poison left, and he contemplates that, but the next thing he does is he takes his pen knife, and he goes over the bed, and he lays on it, putting it right in his heart, and it doesn't penetrate. And the very nerve of this man to write a song like, after that there is a fountain filled with blood. But in that beloved hymn, there is great motivation for soul winning and evangelism. Ere since by faith I saw the stream, all of a sudden, through all this painstaking providence, he sees the stream. Thy flowing wounds supply. Now redeeming love has been my theme and shall be till I die. You ever think about it? Why Jesus loved you? <laughs> you say, well, because he saw some inherent good in me. You don't believe that, do you? I hope you've come to this church long enough not to believe that. You say, well, I know why he loved me. It's because he knew that I would receive him as my personal Savior. I hope you don't believe that either. I'm going to share something with you that is so profound, but this is a great motivation in presenting truth to those that are unregenerate. The only reason Jesus loved you, are you ready for this now? You might want to write it down. It's so profound. The only reason he loved you is because he loved you. That's it. That's the chief motivation for him. I, I don't understand it. But indeed, redeeming love has been my theme and will be until I die. Some of you are familiar with the Moravians? Over 200 years straight, 24-7, over 200 years of an ongoing prayer meeting. Send out these young men. They're never coming back again. And two of them volunteer. They are so convinced that God wants them to go and minister to these slaves. So they give up lands and family and their social standing among the Moravian community to embark on this endeavor to present the gospel. Now here's the thing. If you study the writers about the Moravians, the two things that stood out about these men's lives was their great passion for sinners and their passion for the glory of Christ. They love the gospel. And so as I began to study the Moravians, here's what I found. You know why they put such infinite worth on the souls of men? Because they had taken prolonged seasons of study and meditation on the infinite worth of the Savior. Savior. 
And when they begin to plumb the depths of Calvary, survey the wondrous cross, they saw in that such infinite worth that that was the very motivation because they said, for a God to pay such a price for unregenerate sinners, certainly the souls of men must be worth reaching for Christ. So they go and they get on the ship. And the Moravian community stands on the shore. And do you know what they say as they embark on their journey? May the Lamb receive the reward for his suffering. They ain't coming back. That was a driving force, was the gospel. Divine initiative is another theme. 2 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 19. To wit that God was in Christ. He himself reconciling the world unto himself, not imputing their trespasses unto them. To think, friend, that God took the initiative before the foundation, before the foundation of the world. To compose such a redemption that compelled him to wrap himself in human flesh, live a sinless life, die a substitutionary death, be raised from the dead, ascend into the heavenlies to sit down on the right hand of God to make worshipers out of rebels ought to have some constraining element on our life. Think about it. But also here's another redemptive theme, and that is the infinite price itself. And one of the brothers quoted McShane's poem, which has been put to music, chosen not for good in me, awaken from the wrath to flee. Hidden in the Savior's side, by the Spirit sanctified, teach me, Lord, on earth to show by my love how much I owe. It's the infinite price that also drives us. Spurgeon said this, To bring his chosen to eternal happiness was the high ambition which inspired him and made him wade through a sea of blood. Christ, for me, It's like the communist soldier that was converted. For me, he died. For him, I live. So in conclusion this morning, placing the gospel at the center of missions requires a radical faith. Radical, nothing short of radical, friend. It requires time, self-denial, meditation and discipline no believer can expect to reap the benefits of the gospel in their life unless they are gospel driven and no christian will be gospel driven unless they replace their toys with the gospel do you like to be entertained by that prospect It's only for a few. But what a difference it will make. If you're challenged enough to die to your own self-interest, to shut yourself up alone with God and prayerfully meditate upon the vastness of the gospel, friend, I'm going to tell you something. It will do something for you. It will melt your heart and drive you to reach others for this dying lamb that ever lives to make intercession for you. So here's the practical implications. First of all, a love for Christ and the gospel must be supreme over all the interests and pleasures of this world that compete for your heart. Everything. You see, the most difficult part of this pilgrimage will be at the beginning when you really wonder if you've made the right decision to pursue such a divine object. The gospel must be your most important preoccupation if you're to benefit. But secondly, another important step is this matter of meditation. One of the young men asked last night, you know, I... 
I'm reading the scripture, but it seemed like at times I get more out of biographies or more out of theological books than I do the scriptures. And I said, here's what I would encourage you to do. Maintain your reading, but allow time to meditate. Because suddenly the Spirit of God comes along and enlightens your mind with truth, and that becomes the divine lubricant that will begin to fuel the zeal within and constrain you to live your life on the cutting edge of the gospel. Luther said there are three things that make a man of God, supplication, tribulation, and meditation. We must do it. And then finally, there must be an internalization of those truths of the gospel. Appropriating the truths of the gospel both motivate and embolden us in missions. Now, let me tell you how it works, okay? Evangelists who went out on the streets regularly from night to night to pass out tracts and to preach the gospel were suddenly seized by the temptation to go into a a bar. A bar that accentuated sensuality. And so... Suddenly, he's just overwhelmed, and he darts into this bar. And he walks in, and for just a few moments, a few moments of pleasure, he gets his feel of this sin, and then suddenly becomes self-conscious. He's convicted. He suddenly is looking around to see if anybody recognizes him, and he quickly makes his way out of that maze of darkness and back out on the street. He's thinking, I fail my God. How can I bear his name? How can I witness for his cause? How can I share this Christ with others? Look what I've done. But then he remembers. The gospel of grace makes it a short way back. I don't have to beat myself. In God's economy, The blood of Jesus Christ, His Son, cleanses from all sin. And He agrees with God, I have sinned against you. I have grieved your heart. Fill me now with the Holy Spirit. That same economy of grace that cleanses from sin also enables us to be filled with the Holy Spirit at that moment. He's crying out to God in a phone booth. Only a few minutes after he had so reproached the name of the Savior, he asked God to cleanse him and to fill him with the Holy Spirit. And he believed that grace made it a short way back, that Calvary was only one step away. And guess what happened? He leaves the phone booth with the confidence of what the Savior has promised. And he goes down the street, and 30 minutes later, he leads a soul to Christ. He said, Brother Don, that's turning the grace of God into lasciviousness. No, friend. It's like my friend Charles Leiter says, you present that message to an unregenerate religious person and they'll wallow in it like a pig. But you present that message to a true saint of God, it sobers them up with thanksgiving and motivates them to go on with God. That's the gospel. That's the gospel. So, we cannot motivate ourselves to reach the lost. We can try. But only God can do it. We will attempt, friend, to impose upon ourselves these superficial motivations such as fear of man. What's my pastor or the people going to think of me if I'm not out there preaching on the street or distributing tracts? Or some, sometimes it's guilt. We feel so guilty. Well, after all, the world's going to hell. If somebody don't tell them, who will? I've been through all that as well. Shame. Or perhaps even rewards. Have you ever been in that church before that entices people? If you bring so many to church, if you go out on visitation and you knock on so many doors, then you're going to be rewarded. Oh, poor motivations. But the thing that motivates us supremely and sustains us in our motivation, friend, is an understanding of the wounds of the Savior. 
plumbing the depths of Calvary. This is what God will use to constrain you. Now, before Pastor Kyle, I'm so sensitive to people, and this is a true shepherd. He comes, and he wants to make sure his sheep is not beaten down, and I really admire that. So let me just say it before he comes up here and says it, okay? Brethren, grace does make it a short way back. And if you failed as a saint of God in an area, and perhaps even right now you feel like that God has his hot finger of conviction on something in your life, and you're not willing to turn loose of it, then by the grace of God look to Calvary. Look to the Savior and find sufficient means not only to detach yourself from this thing that weighs you down and encumbers the race that is set before you, but gives you blessed motivation to please Him in all things, particularly missions. Let's pray together. So, Father, once again, we would pray, not as a vain repetition, but, Lord, we mean this from our heart. I mean this from my heart. Oh, to be saved from self, O oh Lord. Oh, to be lost in Thee. Oh, that it might be no more I, but Christ that lives in me. Father, would You today deliver us from cheap motivations, and fill us with wonder, the wonder of the cross, the glories of the Savior, the beauties of Jesus, as we take the time to prayerfully meditate upon what your truth has disclosed to us about Him. And Spirit of God, I pray that more and more you would testify of Christ in our lives and unveil before us greater depths of Calvary's love that we might know with spiritual reality the love of Christ constraining us in all things. Bless your people, Father. Use your people. Strengthen them with might by your Spirit. And may they be a people that's Christ besought. Loving Christ, may Christ have the preeminence in all things that they do as a church and their functionality as well as their own personal walk with you. Lord, I commit these folks to you in Jesus' name. Amen.